<sighs> the Lincoln Continental Mark III. The ultimate in personal luxury traveling. A big, bad bromobile. Welcome everyone to a funky 60-second episode of the Automotive History series, which is my love letter to one of my all-time favorite American personal luxury cars, the car that was seminal for Lincoln, and ushered in a whole new era of American automotive design, the Continental Mark III, a mark of excellence. Lincoln really stumbled through the 1950s. In the early 50s, they were desperately trying to find their own identity, trying to stay away from being simply an overpriced Ford. And in the second half of the 50s, they made quite some effort to fix this, but the results were mediocre at best. First, there was the rather unsuccessful attempt to set up an ultra-luxurious label within Lincoln, the Continental Division. This attempt was scrapped after a few years, and Lincoln then tried to persuade the buying public by offering bizarrely styled oversized sedans. According to some in Ford's upper management, maybe it was time to get rid of Lincoln altogether, but the division was given one last chance to set things right. And they did, with the modernistic and timeless classic, the 1961 Lincoln Continental. And if you want a detailed description of how the story unfolded, you can watch an episode about it if you like. Lincoln was saved, or was it? Much how Lincoln stumbled through the 1950s, this cycle continued throughout the 60s. The Continental for 61, although a breeze of fresh, understated and modernist air in an industry brainwashed by the space race and futurism, was not the savior Lincoln had hoped for. Lincoln just trudged along in the first half of the 60s, mainly taking it up against Cadillac. But Cadillac handsomely outsold Lincoln almost every year. On average, Cadillac sold six times more cars than Lincoln. And even if the Lincoln was an objectively better car than Cadillac in every respect, like speed, power, build quality, etc., it was still lacking that one thing. Reputation. Somehow, Cadillac had nailed its image as the symbol of success. The default choice if you made it in life. Lincoln was for people that, I don't know, wanted to look beyond that? But the Joneses next door certainly wouldn't keep up with you if you had a Continental on your driveway. But if it was a Cadillac, hmm. Not to mention that it was also quiet over at Lincoln's design department. The styling team was on a year-round sabbatical and only came into office two weeks before the final approval for the designs of the new year. They would look at this year's design, change the grill pattern, call it a day and flew straight back to the Bahamas. Now, I'm kidding of course, because I can appreciate a car that goes against the grain and doesn't need year-to-year -year facelifts in order to keep up with the rest. But the rest was moving on. And in the first five years of the 60s, things were quiet over at Lincoln. And according to one industry legend, standing still is a great way to get run over. These words were eventually uttered by none other than Lee Iacocca. And back in the 60s, Lee was vice president of the car and truck division of the Ford Motor Company, and thus Lincoln. And during his time at Ford, he saw that a couple things just weren't working out. First of all, the mass market Ford division, uh, that was doing fine. But the mid-level Mercury and especially the upper market Lincoln divisions were standing still and started to lag behind. It was Ford first, Mercury and Lincoln second. But not everything over at Ford was going smooth. The Ford Thunderbird, the car that invented the term personal luxury car. So a car with a distinctive styling and a very, very long option list to really make it your own, you know, personalize it, originated the concept in the mid-50s and had this market niche all to its own. Until the mid-60s, when the competition, mostly from rivaling General Motors, started to release one personal luxury car model after another. Starting with the Buick Riviera in 1963 and followed by the Oldsmobile Tornado in 1966. And more of these personal luxury coupes from GM were planned, each catering to a different price level. Now, the Thunderbird acted alone and wasn't really a Ford, but firmly positioned roughly in Upper Mercury and Lincoln territory. And as good as the T-Bird was, it couldn't compete with all the personal luxury cars General Motors and others came up with. And here is where Lee got a brilliant idea. 
What if either Mercury or Lincoln would receive a personal luxury car, a deluxe version of the Thunderbird? This would kill two birds with one stone. Both these companies would finally come up with something new, which would allow them to better compete with the rest, and would also take advantage of unused production capacity. Thunderbirds were rolling out of a factory that was just completed, and if this new car would use Thunderbird underpinnings and basic body shells, it wouldn't cost so much to make it, and might also give Thunderbird sales a new boost, and be built on the same assembly line. I think this idea by Lee was further fueled by his latest massive success, the Ford Mustang. Many say that the Mustang was such a success because it appealed to the youth with its low price and sporty image. But I like to think it became such a success because I see it as a Thunderbird light. A sporty Thunderbird. The reason why the Mustang became so successful, in my opinion, is that the car appealed to practically everyone, and not just the youth, because it had also a very long and extensive option list. You could personalize the Mustang like you could personalize your T-Birds. And in the coming years, you could personalize your very own ultra-luxurious, distinctive Mercury or Lincoln. Before the project started, the choice was made that this new top-of-the-line personal luxury car would be given to the Lincoln division. Word on the street was that in the meantime, General Motors was also working on a personal luxury car for their most exclusive division, Cadillac. This gave the ultimate green light for this now Lincoln project. The car would be presented as the new flagship of Lincoln, a halo car to lure customers to Lincoln showrooms. Uh, Mercury wouldn't be completely ignored, however. A deluxe version of the Mustang would temporarily fulfill the role as Mercury's personal luxury luxury car, named the Cougar. Now, with that out of the way, the first phase of development, designing the car, had started in 1965. The design crew flew back from their Bahama sabbatical and enjoyed some Ed's Auto Reviews episodes during the flight, uh, and they also subscribed to his channel, and so should you, before actually getting to work on to design the car. To save on costs, Lee ordered that this new Lincoln would be heavily based on the already existing Ford Thunderbird architecture. Uh, this led to some resistance within the design departments because this would practically mean you get um, well, you, you get a second Thunderbird, a Thunderbird 2.0. To combat this, Lee took a unique approach for this process. Instead of one styling studio, two styling studios within Ford were set up to explore various designs. The first one was the advanced styling studio, and the second one the regular design studio. The first design studio was told, rock out with your socks out, you know, go all in, go nuts. The second studio was told that eh, you can also go nuts, but remember we have a budget, certain rules and, uh, and a time frame. This approach allowed for various design proposals that could be picked and combined by upper management. And who knows, some awesome and weird design tricks from the advanced studio could trickle down on a more normal design from the regular studio, and vice versa. This approach was also used during the development of the Mustang, and, well, we all know what happened. The project was named Lancelot, and this is one of the styling proposals. Very much contemporary, and very much General Motors, if you ask me. The front end is heavily sculpted and dented. I see the typical W shape, you know, where the middle of the front end and the outer front fender corners stick out creating a W-esque shape when looking at it from above, a styling hallmark that you'd usually find over at General Motors. The horizontal grille would stretch all the way around the outer corners and cover the hidden headlights that are placed in the deep pockets. Various designs were suggested for the rear end, including a fairly simple vertical tail light, somewhat in similar fashion as some of the contemporary Cadillacs, or a design that is similar to the front end design. Notice how the car features fender skirts and gives the rear quarter panel a somewhat heavy and planted look. This design was shown to upper management who gave it a lukewarm response. The design wasn't bad, but it, it wasn't catchy either. For a top-of-the-line Halo model was going to be the most expensive Lincoln yet, it lacked that extra undescribable magic. And so this was a problem until Lee came up with a radical idea. According to the stories, he called one of the designers late at night. And during that call, Lee suggested two elements that could be added to the car to give it that little extra that they were looking for. 
First, a massive waterfall grill on the front, and second, on the rear end, a continental tire hump. The idea was that the car wouldn't feature a design full of contemporary mid-60s coolness, but an emphasis on traditional and vintage styling, influenced by cars from the 1930s. The waterfall grille would be a reference to old world continental Europe, and the rear fig tire hump would be a reference to the continental Mark series models from the past, and was already a Lincoln styling hallmark. Some designers were opposed to these ideas, and for good reason. These two design gimmicks were considered to be overplayed styling jokes. The rear Continental kit was a styling fad from the 1950s, and who wants a vertical grille? It's 1965! Straight and horizontal lines are all the rage. Look at Ford's very own cars, like the Mercury's. If you want a vertical grille, you either buy a Rolls or some other outdated European car. And let's not forget that out of all the brands, it was Lincoln that introduced these current styling trends. But Lee was having none of it. For one thing, he had the magical gift to correctly predict future market trends, like the Mustang. And the current trend of rectangular and straight-line modernist design will eventually fade. And looking at the rise in popularity of vinyl tops, the S-Bar on the Thunderbird, and the so-called revival cars, neoclassical design might be the next big thing. Designers begrudgingly tried to incorporate the vertical grille and also tested what looked better, hidden headlights or exposed ones. The rear end was also given the continental tire hump treatment, abandoning the straight line rear end from previous designs. Much of the styling department didn't like these changes, and also some executives weren't pleased. But Lee loved it, and as stubborn as he was, he held on to his beliefs. But, as luck would have it, the big boss also loved it, Henry Ford II. In fact, Henry was impressed by that Duesenberg Revival concept car that came out just a few months before. A car that looks very similar to the design like this future Lincoln. Uh, it could very well be that the story was the other way around, that the designers were inspired by this car, but all this nitpicking doesn't matter, as the design of the future flagship of Lincoln was approved by the big boss. And it was time to make it ready for production. The final design of the car was made ready in 1966, but it would take a few more years before the car would be released. In the meantime, management was debating over the name of the car. Internally, the name Lancelot was applied simply as a placeholder, but it was not deemed as a good candidate. Following the choice to rely on the legacy of the earlier Continental Mark model series, it was decided that this Lincoln would be the next chapter. And here is where it gets a bit confusing. The correct and full name for this car would be the Lincoln Continental Mark VI. But ultimately, it was chosen to name the car the Mark III, as a direct successor of the 1950s ultra-luxurious Mark II. Uh, this was Ford's way to conveniently forget the war crimes on wheels, the late 1950s Continentals. And thus, in 1969, Lincoln revealed what became known as the Lincoln Continental Mark III. A large and luxurious personal luxury car with a huge emphasis on traditional old-school luxury and styling. A 1930s retro-inspired design, if you will. A neoclassic Bromobile. Continuing as the top Continental offering for 1969, is the incomparable Continental Mark III. This authoritative style, individually decisive motor car, has no peer. For once, Lincoln created what instantly became a smash hit. No, really. All these years of financially struggling, getting punched in the face by Cadillac, it was now over. Critics found it an easy cash grab, a car that just jumped into nothing but a shallow marketing trend and looking like a Rolls Royce that had spent the night with a T-Bird, but the buying public loved it. They didn't care that the car had fake wood. They didn't care that the car looked like a gussied up T-Bird. Because what they saw was a car loaded with options and came in a very nice and classical package. An interior with a dashboard with not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, but six holes, providing air, controls, or simply information. Just the right car at the right time. 
a Rolls Royce that lost its stiff upper lip, doused with typical American longer, wider, lower coolness and style. But when you want to talk about the Mark III, you have to mention its arch nemesis, the Cadillac Eldorado. See, Cadillac beat Lincoln by two years. Cadillac released their personal luxury car, the Eldorado, in 1967. And here is where you see two very different interpretations of the luxury car styling. The Eldorado is still part of the modernist school. The Eldo is as sharp as a razor blade, chiseled, beveled crisp with a horizontal emphasis. Also the interior is straightforward and contemporary, formal, businesslike, but certainly not glitzy or glamorous. And here comes along the Mark III, traditional, old school, a strong emphasis on verticality thanks to its shiny centerpiece, the waterfall grill, but also its vertical cornering lamps, curved wheel arches that gives the car a dramatic look. A lowered roof line with a very slim rear window giving the car a dramatic look. Not to mention its interior, using the holy trinity of luxury. Leather, wood and chrome. Guess who got it right? It is almost a paradox. As much as Lincoln introduced the world to modernist car design with the Continental in 61, so it introduced the world to the exact opposite in 69, which is neoclassicism. There were some cars out there that got there earlier, like some of those replica cars or one-off design studies, but the Mark III brought neoclassic brome styling to the American masses in the 1970s. The Mark III became Lincoln's best-selling model, even outselling Cadillac at times, and really made the 70s the golden age of Lincoln. This design, a gamble at first, paid off. Since not a lot of development cost was involved, and the retail price was more like a statement than an actual reflection of the production value, the Mark turned into a nice profit machine. Ford introduced the Brougham styling on all its other divisions, and by the mid to late 70s, the entire American car industry had adopted the many styling gimmicks as introduced by the Mark III. You know, you finally beat Cadillac when you do not design your cars to look like them, but when they design their cars to look like yours. In the meantime, Lincoln shifted its focus on its real moneymaker. After three years, the car was ready for refresh, and after some pushing and pulling, the Mark IV was released. The design of the Mark IV took everything that made the Mark III so popular and maximized it to almost inappropriate levels. In the traditional American way, the car became bigger, wider, longer, lower, and even more opulent while not being all that more practical and roomy inside. And as much as I like, no, no, no love, no adore the Mark III, I consider the Mark IV as almost like a, a parody on its former self. And Lincoln really went off the rails when the Mark V came around, when personalization reached its ultimate peak with the introduction of the Designer series. And hey, if you want to know more, of course, you can watch it. So, after all, Lincoln did create a car that saved Lincoln. The Mark III, although often overlooked because of some other Lincoln models, was seminal. Not only for Lincoln, but for the entire car industry, changing the course from modern to retro, at least for a while. The waterfall grille would remain a Lincoln styling theme that would be carried on as far as the late 2000s. And have I mentioned that I love this car? I guess it's clear by now. This is like my love letter to the car. And I actually got a chance to drive it once. And here I am in this beautiful dark red Mark III that you might recognize. Yes, this Lincoln belongs to none other than Adam, who you may know from the fellow YouTube channel Rare Classic Cars. I got to meet him when I went on vacation to the US and he let me drive his Mark III around the block. Thanks, Adam. It's an experience I'll never forget and once again confirmed my beliefs. The Mark III is one fine Automobile.